And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming RPG Urban Mages, where magic can be just about anything. Yes, even that, and that, and the and and the man who sh who shares in my weather-related pain, the one and only Max Jowett. How are you doing today, man? Not bad, all. Thank you. How's yourself? I am do I am doing good. Thank thank you for putting up with the t with the time zone gap. <laughs> oh no, 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 no! Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah, I, I've when you said when you said that you were a night owl, I had to see about how how late how late that night owlness actually entailed. Oh no, no, don't worry about it. Um, when I first got into role playing, it was through forums when I was a teenager, mm -hmm. which meant a lot of people I was role playing with were like in America with like a five hour time difference. So I've been doing this for like ages and ages and ages now. Well, that ca that kind of delves into the. F the traditional first question I usually give every newcomer, and that is the origin story. You know, walk me through your first, your introduction to role playing and what made it stick. Ooh. Okay, so when I was in school, I was very much one of the weird kids. <laughs> I know, breaking stereotypes, right? <laughs> Um, what happened was, first I got into video games, then I got into forums about video games, and then I found role-playing threads on those forums. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, like, I always enjoyed writing, I always enjoyed that sort of thing, you know, playing pretend, I just hopped on for fun. I will be completely transparent with you all. We were, as young teenagers, everything we did was horribly cringe nowadays. I believe my mentor had said at one point the fir um the first thing you do sucks. Oh, every time without exception. But as I said, I got into role playing with people kind of from around the world. That's where I kind of learned about the whole time zone differences. <laughs> you know, got used to staying up way way past. Mm -hmm. Eventually graduated, uh, made my way to university, and looked at kind of what clubs are available, and one of them was the Roleplay Society. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of like, oh, cool, this is like that thing I do online, but with people in person. <laughs> Checked it out, absolutely loved it, uh, clipped over it ever since. Yep. And... If you don't mind me asking, go, going from video games to game to game forums to role to role play sections within those forums, um, do you recall what ga what game any games in particular that were that was associated with that particular chain of events? Or is that is that digging too deep into the vault? Honestly, a lot of it, like I said, quite young at the time. Mm -hmm. But some of the early stuff was kind of Naruto, Yu-Gi-Oh, Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> yeah, fair. Uh, that was I was kind of <laughs> suspecting that, <laughs> but it's all. But it's always good. It's always good to make these kind of things clear and. There are certain there are certain people within tabletop who might who might sneer at the idea of of role playing using vi using um, video games, but I am not one of them because I know my history. And role playing games and video games have a much closer relationship than people are willing to admit. Plus, I very much come at this from the perspective. I absolutely, absolutely despise gatekeeping. Because, you know, like I said, I was a pretty lonely kid. I had quite a 
hard time making friends in you know meat space for lack of a better term mm-hmm. i genuinely think that being able to find friends through that those forums and that medium i think that genuinely saved me you know if not my life then probably from going down a much darker path that i ended up doing I don't... and i just imagine this horrifying scenario where you know I was made to feel ashamed or embarrassed and I just stopped doing it, then you know, that would have caused like a huge chain reaction. My life would be unrecognizable. I um I think I've I think I've had the fortune of the fact that um I was I was the person who was get who was getting in trouble for get for getting in fights with the <laughs> with the school bully. Respect. Um There's also the fact there's also the fact that um I had played hot as most people would in my, in the area the area of North America that I'm in, I played my I played my fair share of hockey. That was the one sport that was one of the main sports I gravitated to instead of what I was expected, which was basketball. But I already had a reputation of somebody who, um, if you if you see him coming, get out of the way <laughs> on the ice. Because my coach had my coach had given me a very simple instruction. I've told this story a bunch of times, but it always makes people laugh. <laughs> hey, Mildred, you see that guy with the puck over there? Yes, I do, sir. I don't want to fix that. Okay. <laughs> nice, simple, concise. Nah, like the story I like to tell is when I first went to you know the Dundee University Roleplay Society. Mm-hmm. I just immediately saw all of these people in like fabulous jackets who spent their evenings pretending to be elves, and my immediate visceral gut reaction was, "At last, I have found my people." <laughs> but I've all when it comes to the gate, when it comes to the gatekeeping debate, um, I don't despise it, but I have a I have a very specific policy that I take. All right, let's hear. Ap- approach mm-hmm. in good faith. Oh yeah, like approaching good faith, of course. Oh, um, because I when I when I whenever I hear pe- whenever I hear people t- do up a storm about no gatekeeping, go gatekeeping ever, and I'm like, if you real if you really felt that, you would have no white blood cells in your system. Um, well, okay, I I think where I'd agree with that is. If you've got someone in your group who's just a complete arsehole, just a total toxic player, mm-hmm. if you don't kick them out, better players are going to quit the group instead. Yeah, and that's the reason why I brought up that whole good faith thing. Like if some, I have, if someone's if someone's approaching with a willingness to pl- with a willingness to play, I will I will certainly. I'm certainly going. I'm certainly going to feel them out to see to see what this to see what they're made of and po- and possibly test them, but that's no. It's no. It's no different than. Oh, making making sure that's than any sort of risk assessment. Um, I do think. I think th- I think that the ga- that the gatekeeping argument has two people on. On um, extreme ends of things, and I try and be somewhere in the middle. I just, you know, for me, the worst possibility is, you know, someone who, you know, really could grow and be enriched by a hobby and find happiness being turned away because someone was just being a judgmental asshole about it. Like, like you said, you want to be in the middle of this, so I'm. And I, well, I I will admit to being an asshole, but I am an equal opportunity asshole. <laughs> like, I'll get I'll give I'll give people a hard time, but I give everybody a hard time. And the people at my t- and some of the people at my table know not to step over the line; otherwise, they'd have to go through one of the um, punishments. Well, I remember my creative writing teacher in university was quite... One of the things he did is if you asked a question, and nev- but without really thinking through what you meant by it, he'd ask you to explain yourself, and often that kind of shut people up. 
Like when people were talking about writing, one thing we learned very quickly was never to use the word flow. <laughs> because then you'd always be like, well, what do you mean by flow when no one had an answer? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I think I've, I think I've only... I've only ever used um, flow in the in terms of flow theory when it comes to game design. Yeah, like when you kind of just you're in it, you're in the zone. You're not really thinking about it anymore. You're just doing. Um, flow theory in in game design, as I've understood it, is the ba is the balance is making sure that you have a balance between difficulty and time. Oh. Uh, if you have too much difficulty over too short of a time relative to what you're trying to do, that's going to result in frustration, and on the opposite end, it can result in boredom. Hmm. Uh, I can't. Cl I originally came across the concept through folks like Game Soup. I can't claim credit for the idea, but given given that given that role playing. Um, Origin story that you mentioned to get back to get back to that. Um, what was your what was your first full what was your first full on role playing game, if you recall? Was it was it D and D like it's so, like it is for so many others, or was it something different? Uh, for me, some of the first role play games I ever actually played, um, some of the Warhammer forty k games, I think. Dark Heresy and Unknown Armies. So that one's not Warhammer 40k, well, but it is. Actually, that br that brings me to something else. I was I was going to ask, <laughs> given the given the subject matter of urban mages being about well urban magic, there were two games that I was going I was going to ask if you were familiar with it at all <laughs> or if you had some experiences with. One of them. Well, was, I said one, one of those. Yeah, one of them was Unknown Armies. Because I was very much getting that vibe when I was going through the book. When I was going through the uh, Kickstarter page on the matter. The other one, is all, which is also known as How to Make Reality Your Bitch, um, <laughs> is Mage the Ascension. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I had a few people kind of discuss with me about whether I should be calling the game Urban Mages or not, just in case it was too similar to Mage the Ascension? Mm. Mage the Asc Mage the Ascension is in is in its own is in its own league and Exactly. The, the like you're not reason, going to top all that. The big reason I make all I make the jokes when it comes to Mage is how ridiculously OP characters can get in that. Even with the things that are supposed to be controlling factors, it it um there's a whole lot of bending reality over over in a lot of the, a lot of the rule set and um the oh, I chronicles deep version of the, the I like I like it too but I can't but I can't den I can't deny the, what's in front of me oh no I really really enjoy kind of like big power messing with reality things um. One of the first roleplay games I attempted to run, I say attempt because I did a really terrible job at it, was Exalted. Oh, I love Exalted. Oh, I love it too, but, you know, maybe as the first game I tried to run with a mixed group, eight players. Eight, eight players is pushing it a little bit, especially with something like Exalted, um, given the time yeah, frame. Yeah, exactly. Of Second edition. Second edition, yeah. Yeah, that would make, that would make sense given the given the time frame. Um, the better edition, in my in my opinion, and I've looked through third and third. Ha I have some issues with it. I think third edition does some interesting things. I'll give it that. It does some interesting things, but I keep getting reminded of when Rich made a comment that it was a very classic case of missing the point. Because yeah. somebody somebody had asked why Magitek was not it was not in the book early on, and he had said that Exalted is Wuxia and mythology as a reason for not having Magitek in the book. Which I think this I think this was a case of missing the point, much in the same way much in the same way that. 
imagine imagine saying that that re that red dwarf is 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 just science fiction or saying that or or po or pointing at or pointing at early or pointing at early um black and white era doctor who and saying the entire thing the entire series is just that <laughs> It can be that thing, but there's a whole lot of other things that that th that those properties can be, and Exalted is no different. Honestly, I can see arguments for either case, because you know, I do get one of the big appeals of Exalted is that it is just so over the top, but there are so many influences sort of stacked into it. But on the other hand, I always kind of got the sense that you know. A lot of the Magitech was supposed to be either really rare or was supposed to be associated with uh, Autocathon. Autophon? Autocathon. Never sure how yeah, you... Autocathon is who you're is who you're thinking. Yeah, exactly. Which always felt like kind of late game stuff to me. Which I can I can see I can see that, but I I have a very um sandbox ment sandbox mentality, and I'd like to see um low and high level get. Get these get support because eventually, eventually, especially with something like Exalted, you can't just be murder hobos all the time. No, absolutely not. Uh, you can barely be murder hobos starting out of the gate. But as you well, I mean, like you can, but there should be consequences for it. Mm -hmm. But as you, but once you're once you're higher up on essence, um. You're. It's not. It's not like you're. It's not like you're some anonymous figure when you're not in town. Every, people who are, people are gonna know who you are. And even with that, when you have an when you have an enti when you have entire casts that are dedicated to building things, it's only a matter of time before somebody decides to, at the very least, reverse engineer Magitech. Oh, certainly. But also, the impression I got is that that was very much. A much more high level distant goal for them because my understanding of it is that you know the reason magitech kind of worked in the first stage but not so well necessarily now is that the infrastructure that was necessary to support it just does not exist anymore for the most part mm -hmm. like mostly there's the realm defense grid and even then that doesn't work as well as it could it's never it's never outright stated but because of because of the fact that there's multiple avenues that can be taken, that's that's the reason why I have taken that approach. Plus, um, let's not let's not forget that there was a, oh. that there was an entire supplement dedicated to to Magitech in in one form in the, with um Odinal's Codex. Oh, exactly, exactly. Okay, actually, I will say though, just because I so rarely get a chance to talk about this, <laughs> can I just give my like my one big hot take on Exalted? Go ahead. I think the Great Curse is the worst part of the setting. I can, I can certainly, I can certainly see it. It, I've, um, I've held the opinion that the Great Curse is a case of the Paladin problem. I understand hmm. why it, why it was implemented because you need to have some sort of, um, draw, you need to have some sort of drawback. The... I do appreciate that from a mechanical perspective. My issue is, I think the way that the books frame it is that, okay, basically the setting is the way it is because the Sidereals and the reason they overthrew the Solars is because they became corrupt. But I think it's weirdly, almost uncharacteristically, politically naive of Ex for Exalted. To say that, you know, the reason immortal god kings with no real challenge to their power went corrupt is because of a curse. And the only reason... And I always feel like you probably could restore the First Age or something close to it if people in the setting knew about the curse, but they arbitrarily don't. Well, you can blame... Um... I think, I think the intent is that you're supposed to blame that on sidereal fuckery. 
as if the sidereal exalted are supposed to be um, their version of Comstar. <laughs> Which, to be fair, they, to be fair, they kind of open themselves up to what with the whole destroying the mask to try and prevent people from knowing uh, knowing about what happened, but in the process making it so that people easily forget them. I, I just think you know, with the sidereals, you actually have this quite interesting question because you know, without the solars. Creation is, you know, just on a downward spiral. It's been becoming increasingly post-apocalyptic. Mm. I mean, you go from the first stage to, you know, the Great Contagion, the, you know, the Fair Folk invasion. Now the Death Lords and the Abyssals are kind of doing their thing. And, you know, there's a sense that, you know, maybe the Solars could fix this. But then you run the risk of them just becoming corrupt and mad with power. And, you know, the question is, do you take that risk in the hopes of maybe building a better tomorrow, or do you kind of accept the lot you have? Yeah. I think, you know, the curse kind of makes that such a moot question. Mm -hmm. It means there is kind of a fixed definitive answer to it. Yeah, which, truth, truth be told, when it comes to a lot of those... Um, I apply rule zero. If, oh, every GM does it eventually, whether they admit it or not. <laughs> I just I just cut through the bullshit on the matter, and and I just do I just do it. Oh, it's probably the reason why I don't go why I don't go to many organized play events. For, um, that and I'm a little bit of that and some I have a bit of a brutal honesty issue, but. Moving, moving past, moving past that, um, I'd say one of the big reasons that I got a very unknown armies vibe is the way you, is the way magic is treat is treated within this setup, where there's where the magical stylings are not are um are reflect are reflective of th of things that would be commonplace in 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 a modern or an urban setting. As opposed to more classical stylings of magic, um, whether that whether that be the spheres that people are known, f no, that people are familiar with in D and D, or the multitude of systems in Ars Magica, which is a rabbit hole I'm not drunk enough to go down right now. <laughs> I oh yeah, like I've. Like I can tell you from personal experience that I've seen people play a princess bride mage, a Roald Dahl mage. <laughs> In a recent campaign, I think someone played a slime mage. Mm -hmm. Like you absolutely can play more classical things if you want to, but you know, other options exist. Yeah. And with the with that in with that in mind, oh. I'm the first thing that the first thing that I'd be curious about is how exa how exactly your do you have a do you have a preset of purviews or is um, purview something that it, something that the person would cr what um, create on their own a la um, concepts in a world of darkness game? Oh no, uh, players can come up with literally any purview they want. Mm -hmm. It's it's not. That's not like a fixed list. Yeah, I mean, I do like have example characters in the book just to illustrate. Hey, here's what you could do if you did this. Here's what you could do if you did that. But the choice is up to you. That's that's the other thing that I that I was curious about because an easy trap to fall into with a lot of designs is what I like to call swim. Damn it. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm listening. Where you're just where you're just thrown right, you're just thrown right into the middle of things without it without a proper amount of guidance. Um, TV tropes calls this guy damn it. Yeah, I get the concept. There's one of the things where the I try to avoid this in my system mm -hmm. is starting characters pick free spells from the list of seventeen. Uh, players get one experience point at the end of every session, mm -hmm. and it costs four experience points to get a new spell. So if you're playing every week, this means, you know, 
you have to spend like a month with your ter current toolkit before you add something else onto it. Now, when it comes to the, when it comes to that small of a spell list, comparatively speaking, is there a whole lot more that individual spells can d can potentially do? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, let's say, for example, there's the summoning spell. That basically lets you customize a bunch of creatures that are associated with purview and allows you to summon them to help you with pretty much whatever they're good for. Mm -hmm. Which, as you can imagine, makes it just this incredibly versatile spell that can work very differently depending on what your purview is. So, for example, let's say that you're playing a fire mage. You could summon things like dragons and ifrits and hellhounds, whereas... I had a character in another campaign who was playing an alternative mage. And basically what she did was just summon alternate versions of herself from different realities. Mm -hmm. So for example, here's a version of me if I'd studied more. Here's a version of me if they were like a badass character. Yeah. Oh. One, pr one particular spellcasting concept that I've that I've been a fan. I've been a fan of is the concept of the spell thief, and I Ooh. I first got introduced to this particular concept um, in my early AD and D days when I when I would run um, Al Qadim games, which is one of the, is one of the hidden settings for um the for the AD and D era, basically basically going full Arabian Nights. Oh. A spell thief is exactly what it sounds like. They don't have, as far as spe as far as spells on their own, they don't they don't have they don't have much, but they can st they can swipe, store, and ca and cast spells that they take from other people. Sure. Oh, I've seen some compare them to Rogue from X Men, which makes sense. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a hundred percent on point, but it's close enough. It's close enough that you get the idea. And if if someone were, and to put to put that into to practice, if somebody wanted to have it where they where um instead they don't have access to spells on their own, but they can but they can borrow spells from from other people. How would you translate that into your system? Hmm. That's kind of a tricky concept, I'll be the first to admit that. Okay, so first of all, the way a lot of these spells work is that they explicitly relate to your purview. Mm -hmm. So the purview basically being the concept that you feel more your mind. So what would we call that? Um, I'd say in this case, thievery. Thievery. Okay, cool. And basically the way that a lot of spells work is, and I'll be the first to admit, you know, not every spell necessarily lends itself organically to every But some are quite a good fit. Mm -hmm. So, for example, let's say there's the enchantment spell. This spell basically lets you take normal objects and then turn them into magical objects. One thing that I can imagine you doing with that concept would be that you could copy the effects of other people's magical items. Mm -hmm. Or, if we were sticking with the whole thief thing, one of the spells in the game, Kinesis, is basically the ability to manipulate objects in purview. Mm -hmm. Now, this can mean manipulating, you know, substances associated with your purview, or it can mean manipulating things in a way that is related to your purview. So, for example, a thief mage could use kinesis to take things away from people. Which I, I, can, cer I, can, certainly go, I can certainly go with, and I'm pretty sure 
Truth, truth be told, if I were to do the, if I were to do the a character who is a spell thief in this kind of system, I know a lot of people would think a st a standard pickpocket. That's not the approach that I would go, I'd go with because that's too pedestrian. Instead, go with the phantom thief approach. Mm -hmm. you know, leave a card saying, at this t at this time on this day, I'm going to steal this thing from the museum, and there's nothing you can do about it. Oh, you could get real abstract with it. Um, for example, one of the spells you could theoretically take is Curse. Mm -hmm. Now, you can only curse someone if you've defeated them, effectively. Basically, it's an alternative to killing someone. Mm -hmm. But if you are able to curse someone, essentially, you can do something bad to them. Very open-ended with what that could be. So if you want to play a Thief Mage... You could totally take like an abstract concept away from someone. Yeah. Oh. That's it. I'd say. I'd say in that regard, it wouldn't be too far removed from soft and wet from Jojolian. The most re the most recent chapter with Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. I'll be honest. A lot of people who've played this game have said that. Oh, you could really use this to run like a Jojo. Game. Which... <laughs> because. It is set, you know, in modern day, approximately reality, mm -hmm. and also a lot of the game is kind of based on the ability to sort of creatively interpret the rules. Yeah, and that's an ideal way. That's an ideal way to utilize some of the more interesting stand abilities that have shown up through that series over the years. Oh. Oh yeah, like, I think you could probably mimic a lot of what Soft and Wet does through the Reality Warping spell. Mm -hmm. Which is basically, you use your magic, you affect an area of spell. how high you roll depends on, like, how big that area is. And then you can basically Im apply an effect on it that applies to everything within the area indiscriminately. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do a Soft and Wet thing of saying, I take the friction away from the floor, and now it's super slippery, that would be how you do that. Yeah, I remember. Um, I remember in in a design contest when I was when I was on a forum, a yeah, role playing forum regarding One Piece, we had a we had a bit of a design contest about designing a devil fruit. Um, I ended up coming up with one that I called the Shot Shot Fruit. It's One Piece was one of the influences. on my design of this <laughs> just because you know i like it when you can kind of boil people's powers down to you know this is their theme this is the idea partly because in my experience people get more creative when they have to work within certain limitations mm -hmm. if you give people like unlimited options no one kind of knows where to start yeah analysis paralysis is what we call it. And to that end, since you mentioned limits, now in obviously obviously one obviously one can't sl one can't sling their strongest spells all, all the all the time, otherwise things would get very bo very boring very quickly or very chaotic very quickly. Oh exactly. Couldn't and agree with you more. In Mage there was of course the concept of paradox. Um what sort of limitation do you have when it comes to use of magic? Is it is it through some is it through some sort of resource, or is the limitation a bit more esoteric? Okay, so there are a couple of ways the game handles. This. First off, whenever you cast a spell, you spend a mana point. Mm -hmm. Now, 
when you inevitably run out of mana, you are free to recharge it whenever you want. The problem is, whenever you do, you have to make a luck roll. Mm -hmm. If you do badly on this rock consequence, Now, I suppose one I I should have I should have gotten to this earlier, but one thing that I think is important I think is important to cover is the core die mechanic, because every game is go every game is going to have one different, and I didn't see anything on that on the Kickstarter page, so I think that mm -hmm. is something worth going into. Um. Is this? Are you doing a single die approach? Are you doing a die pool? Are you doing roll high, roll low? What is the what is the core um, die resolution system that you have? Okay, so I wanted to keep the die resolution system relatively simple. I'm a big believer that you know, when it comes to systems, you have to pick and choose what's going to be complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, if it doesn't have to be complicated, keep it simple. Yeah, the KISS method. So, exactly, exactly. Is there any extra effect if somebody rolls a natural 10 or a natural 1? Basically, there's difficulty levels that a character has to hit in order to succeed or fail. Mm -hmm. The difficulty levels being 7, 9, 11, 13, 15. Mm -hmm. Now, you might have noticed from that, since 15 is the highest difficulty, not everyone's going to have a stat of 5. Mm -hmm. This means that some challenges will be so hard that, you know, it's impossible to succeed even if you roll a 10. And so, unless you're, like, really, really good at what you're doing. Yeah. But it also means that, you know, one will always be a failure. Mm -hmm. Now, with... Do you... Is it... Is it a case where all... Where, um... Most die rolls are, go, are going to involve ju just a d10 plus the attribute, or do you have a skill system as well? <laughs> I do have a skill system as well. 
basically the idea is that during character creation there's 12 skills you get for free mm -hmm. and then you and the skills you get for free are stuff like you know reflexes initiative willpower notice mm -hmm. constitution all the basic stuff like that and then there's the advanced skills that you know you don't necessarily have unless you choose to take them so you know that's things like stealth streetwise fighting style the way the system works is if your character attempts to advance skill but you don't add anything to your d10 it's d10 plus zero All right. And I'm in that regard, would magic use be considered be treated as a skill? No, basic magic isn't doesn't apply to any of the skills. Basically, it only applies to your spells. Yeah. The what I'm curious about is if um is if magic is something you have to roll for, or if it's fire and forget. It depends on the spell for the most part. Mm -hmm. So, for example, take the blast spell, which is using magic to zap things. You absolutely roll magic for that. That's basically roll magic when making an attack. Mm -hmm. Easy enough. Then you have more abstract things. For example, the storage spell. And the concept behind this spell is it basically gives you your own personal pocket dimension that you can kind of put things in and take them out of whenever you want. Mm -hmm. That's one where you don't really have to roll for magic, but your pocket dimension can have a bunch of upgrades. And basically, the higher your magic attribute is, the more upgrades you can take. Mm -hmm. And in that in that regard, I do want to I do want to go into the idea of customizing spells. Oh, oh yes. So if let's let's take the let's take the good old blast, which mm. I I get the feeling on pa on paper it's just it's just it's just dealing it's just dealing mad magic based damage to a sing to a single target. Well, suppose suppose somebody wants to turn that single little blast into a into a volley and throw a and throw a bunch of blasts at one throw a bunch of blasts at once or. Or go with the or go with some good old AOE stuff. Oh. How would they do that? Well, the way that blast works is for the most part I'd say, you know, if you were just doing like a one guy, I'd probably just fluff that describe that as just fluff. Like this is how you're describing the attack rather than just one big thing. But Blast does contain rules that basically allow you to do AoE attacks, allow you to pin people, and it also allows the blast to be psychic instead of physical. Mm -hmm. And in that si one of the th one of the thing I'm curious about cuz a lot of a lot of people whenever they pick whenever they pick summoning, they all it's always um it's always some. It's always summoning creatures, but no one ever thinks of say summoning items or artifacts or or the like, which is something that I've dipped into with certain characters, where hmm. they where they're some they're summoning they're they're summoning um um I think in one I think in one case it was the it was these relic swords that you could only get through summoning because the sword doesn't physically exist. That's cool. That's cool. Oh. Uh, would it help if I gave like the complete list of? I think it. W I think it would a bit just to. Because otherwise, like I get it. It's a bit abstract. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the full list of spells in the game are blast. Use magic to attack your enemies. Block. Use magic to defend yourself and others. Boost. Enhance your natural abilities. Construct. Create a useful tool. Curse. Inflict a terrible fate on a defeated enemy. Mm -hmm. Dark side. Empower another spell at a painful cost. Divination. Uncover hidden information. Enchantment. Turn regular objects into magical items. Kinesis. Move objects around of your magic. Mesmerize. 
influence or outright control a person's mind. Metamorphosis becomes something inhuman. Potions, brew potions that change whoever drinks them. Reality warping, transform the surrounding area. Shapeshifting, instantly assume a magical disguise. Mm -hmm. Storage, store objects and people inside a pocket dimension. Summoning, call forth supernatural allies. And teleportation, cross great distances instantaneously. Mm -hmm. cer it certainly helps. And given, given that, um, something, I'm cu something I'm curious about is when you... If you were to spend X, if you were to spend XP to un to unlock a new spell, um, mm. is it is it going to be a case of that spell's going that spell is going to work at the at the ex the exact same way the exact same w the exact same way um, no regardless of how early or late game you are or it, are there means to upgrade spells. I will say, for the most part, mostly it does work the same way. But it can be a bit of a case-by-case -case basis to a lesser extent. Mm -hmm. Some spells are basically just do more or are more effective if you have a higher magic attribute. Or some spells are tied to one of your non-magic attributes. For example... Your presence score determines how many summons you can have with if you have the summoning spell. Mm -hmm. So theoretically, by raising one of your act, you also improve that spell. Yeah, and I'm guessing that even with even with that, the spells that do tie themselves to an attribute outside of magic, um, only tie only tie themselves to one attribute at most. You know. A, Basically a roundabout exactly. way of saying there's no mad problem. Yeah, pretty much. Oh. If you're not familiar, mad is short for multiple ability dependency. I, I get it, I get it. I played enough D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. Oh. But taking taking that into taking that into account, since you brought up magic items, I want to delve into that a bit. Yes, is, please do. Is it a case where, where um, a ma where a magic item, whether it be created through a spell or otherwise, is essentially a sp is essentially an item that has some sort of spell stored in it, or is there more to it? Okay, so the way the game handles that is there's spells, but the game also uses something called powers. So. Powers are basically things that a human being simply cannot accomplish. So, for example, flying, breathing fire, turning intangible, things like that. Mm -hmm. There's basically a chapter that features dozens of powers, and if you're making a magical item, you can basically say, oh, I'll take that one. Mm -hmm. So, if you wanted to have, like, a flying carpet, you would give it yourself the flying power. Powers are also used for the summoning and metamorphosis systems. Mm -hmm. So, for example, again, summoning. If you wanted to summon a zombie legion, you could take the powers of Horde, Undead, <laughs> maybe Venomous. Mm I don't know about you, but if I but if I'm gonna be if I'm gonna be summoning a horde instead of summoning a horde of undead, um, summon a horde of giant scorpions. Hell yeah, that's easily doable. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be giving the enemy nightmares. I may as well get creative with it. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think if you're going to do that one, horde giant venomous. Mm -hmm. Natural weapons. Yeah. I mean, I've got, I've gone with that. I think, um, I think there was, I think there was one, there was one instance where the where there was a where there was a summoner who wanted wanted something different instead of again an un, again an undead horde. So there, so and since they were a druid at the time, their approach was. Well, 
Bears. Lots of bears. God, did you ever play Dragon Age Inquisition? Yes. So you know that bears are scarier than demons, right? <laughs> <laughs> as some as somebody who's ha who's had to deal with horror stories about about um about grizzly bears his whole life, um, that's not too far off. <laughs> Not news exactly, so just having a whole like bears coming towards you. Uh, there was a running gag about bear ca about bear cavalry when I was starting out. So, I mean, the only thing the only thing worse is dealing with moose. Yeah, like people always underestimate how bloody huge they are. They're also jerks. Jerks who just. I, I believe it. it. I can believe it. Um, um, I know at least one, I know at least one of my I know at least one of my players would potentially use this to summon an army of geese. Hell yeah. Because, <laughs> well, geese are also assholes. Whether that, whether that be the animal or the or the character in Final Fight. <laughs> yeah, I had I had to I had to make that joke. But given that, given that, is it a is it a case where when applying when applying powers to a magic item, some po some powers would be um, unlimited and some powers would be a certain number of uses per session, or 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 pick whatever um, time in increment you want on that front. Uh, yes, that is pretty much the case uh some powers you know it for example one of the powers is metal body which is your body is made of metal mm -hmm. it would not make sense to say that you can only benefit times but then there's another power in the game called jinx which is basically where you force someone to screw up by giving them bad luck that's one of the ones where, you know, you can use it a little bit of times in a scene. Mm -hmm. which, cer which certainly makes sense. And it's it sounds like the time increment is either scene or session in your case. Yes. Now, I'd like to talk a bit about some um, combat. Now, Please do. One of the obvious things to go over would be would be the lethality of combat, but what I'm more curious about in that regard is whether or not you're going with a HP system or if you're going with a wound penalty system. I'm going with an HP system. All right. I'm guessing that I'm guessing that was to make things sim make things simple. K I S S. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but one of the big priorities that, you know, I kind of had with this game is, you know, like I said, players can hypothetically summon armies of... It's very easy in that context, I think, for people to maybe potentially forget that they're playing mortals. Mm -hmm. I... That's why I want combat to, you know, have this feel of danger to it. You know, remind them that, yes, you're playing a mage, but also mages are squishy. But ev even with that, it sounds like you you don't want you don't want them to be squishy to the point of, of one bad roll could put someone in the dirt. Yes, the system makes it so that, you know, it's possible to just one-shot a PC because of a single bad roll. And given given that, are in a combat phase, would there be multiple op would there be multiple opportunities to mitigate damage the way you have to the way you have to roll roll to see if damage e even hits in um, Exalted or any game under the Storyteller system? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact. First off, you roll to see if you can dodge the attack. Mm -hmm. Then, if the attack hits, you roll to see how much damage you take from it. And there's also, 
during combat the option of using defend other mm -hmm. where you use your turn to kind of shield another pc but that uses your action for the round yeah now given the crazy amount of stuff that you can do with um magic with magic use i'm guessing that you ha that when you were designing the game you were going for theater of the mind and not grid combat just out of the gate yes absolutely um in the chapter where i kind of explain all the mechanics for action scenes first off i kind of go for like the basic stuff like okay this is how attacks work this is how hp works this is how recovery works then i have like, this little text box that basically says okay everything else is that uh, is it going to be explained this chapter is edge case stuff like, what if there's an ambush? What if someone's hiding? What if the floor turns into... It's not necessarily going to be relevant all the time. <laughs> you know, like, look it up if you need to understand what to do. But, you know, don't feel pressure to, like, learn all of it right away. Mm -hmm. Now, some games have put in a extra effort system within the, within their setup. Um, Exalted, of course, had, much like all the other games in the Storyteller system, had willpower. Eclipse Phase has Moxie. Um, fate has fate points. Yeah, Fate has fate points. Um, D and D inspiration. If I'm being honest, I think I think action points from Fourth Edition is more applicable than inspiration from Fifth. But makes sense. That, but that's getting a bit more into the weeds. Honestly, I think Fourth Ed is underrated. Oh, join join the club on that front. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I um, I had got I had gotten in more than my fair share of fights when pe when people would um, would make the MMO comparison. I'm like, you have you barely even play MMOs. What the hell are you talking about? Also, um, you know the dev team kind of admitted like, yeah, of course we're inspired by MMOs. We're inspired by like all the games. Oh. I've just never been a fan of this idea that there are certain things that you ha that you are that you're supposed to take inspiration from, and certain things are forbidden. Because I had to put up with that. I had to put up with that shit during the Tome of Battle days in Third Edition. <laughs> exactly. Like it's such a lousy, insular world. You you're not allowing your get new, fresh ideas into it. Well, what I had said at the time was. A lot of the a lot of the so-called traditions that are in D and D and, and are in other games are a reflection of things that they happen to be fans of, things that they happen to be fans of. And you're eventually going to have a whole generation who's going to have a different set of fantasy things that they are fa that they are fans of, and their design is going to reflect that. Exactly. And I think. I said that almost. Tw I said that about twenty years ago, and I think history has borne me out. But when it comes now, with the with that in mind, when it comes to extra effort, do you have a similar system, or is that is that would that be in the purview of um, spells? Okay, so there is a mechanic to represent that called resources which is at character creation, you basically pick two resources, which is stuff your character has. It can be either, you know, a special talent, it can be group membership or qualifications, or just like a thing, like an ancestral sword or whatever. Once per Each resource can be used once per session. Mm -hmm. And if you can argue that it would help with whatever you're attempting, you can either reroll your dice or you can add one d five to your roll. All right. When, the way you described resources, could it be somewhat analogous to backgrounds in World of Darkness? I think that'd be a fair way to describe it. Yeah. Oh. So, for example, let's say you wanted to play a half orc, mm -hmm. and you made that one of your resources. Theoretically, any situation where you think being a half orc could help you out with something you could tag it and improve it all a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now, given the, given the fact that a lot of RPG design is resource management, no matter how much 
certain folks want would want to claim otherwise. Um, a concern that a concern that's all that's often cropped up in ga in game design is what I like to call the Nova problem. Yeah. That being players who who um actually the Nova problem isn't the isn't the best word for it. The better word would be the would be the rainy day paradox. Okay, I think I know what you're referring to. Um, or to put it another way, I can't. I can't. You right the you're in the middle of the final boss and someone's singing. I can't. I use can't one use of my... all the best healing items. What if I need them for <laughs> at the final fucking boss? <laughs> Yeah, no, that's... Okay, you know how I said that early on that, that basically you can recharge your mana points whenever you want? Mm -hmm. Part of the reason I do that is because I don't want players to feel like they can definitively run out of mana. To explicitly to avoid that problem. In the very, very first draft of the game, I had this idea that I thought would just be like, a nice thing to do for my players, which is, hey, you know what, if someone brings snacks to the game and allows like the rest of the group to share them, you could just sort of recharge all your mana for free. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, here's the problem with that. My players kind of cottoned on to this idea and realized, oh, so if we only cast five spells per session and we bring snacks to the next one, <laughs> we recharge <laughs> our mana without any consequence. Mm -hmm. And what you ended up with was players kind of going, mm, well, I don't want to cast this spell because I only want to cast five spells this set. So even though I implemented like this extra little rule that I thought was being nice to my players, what I was actually doing was incentivizing them to play in a way that wasn't fun. <laughs> oh. For me personally... So I scrap that early. <laughs> yeah, for, for me personally, I probably would put... I probably would... Um, would put would put it would put it would probably house rule that um your purview determines ha determines how you're going to be recharge recharging your mag recharging your magic points. Like maybe you'd it's not too far removed from the um contract rule. This particular idea wouldn't be too far removed from say the contractor rules in the anime Darker Than Black. I know what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. I'd be a bit careful about that just from personal experience. Because I imagine if the purview can be literally anything you want, you run the risk that some would be a lot harder to recharge. Them. Yeah, and I'm not saying this is a I'm not saying this is a perfect this is a perfect answer to that. It's ju it's just um something that I'd probably work out with players. Like if they're if their purview is ice cream, well, they recharge it by, well, eating ice cream. Which means you have to have ice cream on you all the time, or else. Oh. Yeah, it, it's definitely one you figure out. Like, in my experience as a game designer, mm -hmm. you are never going to make a perfect system that doesn't have any flaws. Every no. decision you can possibly make is going to have trade-offs. No, the... The approach, I've learned that the I've learned that the smarter thing to do is to try and have instead of trying to get rid of all instead of trying to get rid of flaws completely, um, make it so that the that the flaws are less of a problem. Yeah, exactly. Ideally, you want all the parts of your system in harmony so that you know it's greater than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. oh. And you know that means your system won't be able to do absolutely everything under the sun, but no system is able to do everything under the sun. Well, I'm, told, like, I'm told GURPS could, but... Oh, um, GURPS pretends it can do everything, and then it tries to sell you a... Oh, people have, people have tried... People get real mad at me when I tell them that they're wrong about about saying that GURPS is the only um, R RPG that I need. And I, I said... Um, I, just because I still have my TA-83 doesn't mean I want to use it. Oh, no, like, first RPG book I ever bought, like, before I probably understood what RPGs were, was the GURPS Discord RPG. Mm -hmm. and 
So, you know, I, I don't want to knock it for sentimental reasons, but, you know, if it really could do everything, why would it need to sell you so many supplements? And even get, even games that ha even universal games that have only one have only one book um when you tr i think a, i think a lot of pe i think a few people um use use a handful of different a, f a few different genres and then think that that covers all of it and most universal style games that you'll see nowadays aren't going to make that same mistake um the big one that comes to mind is Savage Worlds and the fact that it makes it pretty clear that it is designed for pulpy style games. Oh yeah, exactly. Like the assumptions are baked into it basically. Um if you try to play a Savage Worlds campaign and your character doesn't have a bunch of terrible flaws, you're going to have a bad time. Yeah. But if you, if you want if you wanted something with with a bit more de with a bit more detail Savage Worlds isn't gonna cut, isn't gonna fit the bill. Exactly. You'd probably be better off with Hero System in that regard, or ro or uh, Role Master if you love tables. Like I like the Fate System. I think it's pretty versatile, but you have to know how to massage it a bit to fit the setting. I've um, I have I have I I do remember criticizing the. Stunt and stunt and refresh relationship at character creation with fate, as well as the fact that I think fate could do, could stand to do a better job at exp and a lot of games could stand to do a better job, but fate especially with this regarding what is a good idea and a bad idea for aspects. Yes, I really, really strongly agree. With you. And in that vein. Like, I, I figured it out, but I wish the book maybe gave better guidance from the offset. Yeah. In that, in that vein, ha have you considered putting in some sort of advice about what would be... What are good ideas for purviews, and what might be questionable ideas for purviews? In character creation, what I say is the GM has the right to veto a purview if it's either completely tasteless or an obvious attempt at exploiting the system. Like, making an everything mage. The way I kind of try to look at it is... I don't think it's possible to write a rule that will stop people who want to play something in bad faith from approaching something in bad faith. Mm -hmm. Which I can, like if... I can no, understand sorry. that. You know, like, I, I want to assume that most who play this game are, you know, trying not to be dicks about it. <laughs> as much as I, as much as I like seeing what, seeing what ways that I can break a system, a lot of that is through just fun bits of experimenting that I don't even, I don't even play or seeing, seeing certain ridiculous excesses, um, you know, the th stuff like pun pun. Oh, yeah, no, no, absolutely. Like, I don't disparage people who like to break the game a little. It's fun. It's satisfying. <laughs> and I will admit that when it comes to that sort of guidance thing, the example I always come to is this two-page spread that was in 13th Age, which is, in some regards, a better D&D than D&D. &D. But it was in regard to their one unique thing. And they gave a few examples of okay, these are good these are good ideas for a one unique thing. These are ideas that might be questionable, but talk it with your GM. And these are absolutely not. This is way too powerful for a one unique thing. <clears throat> and the example of the one unique thing that was a absolutely not was I'm a reincarnation <laughs> of one of the previous icons and I remember everything from my past life. That would be pushing it a little bit. Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> and now taking taking that into into account. Uh, I'd like to t I'd like to touch on the co the concept of collaborative setting creation. Yes. Like when I th when I think about that the 
the one game that comes to mind for me and was and was one of my very early reviews is Mystic Empyrean, which is technically oh, an optional one. game. Uh, Mystic Empyrean what is the sole RPG contribution from level ninety nine games and is heavily inspired by Legend of Mana. And it does have a world creation um, set up with its balance deck, where pe where people ca where you can kind of have a revolving um, GM setup. When it comes to that world, when it comes to that world creation, I'm vastly mm. simplifying things, but that was what came to mind when it came to set when it came to setting creation. But I'm curious what um, Urban Mage's take would be. Mm. Okay, so first of all, the book does try to lay down some ground rules, which is, you know, the game is set in modern day reality, mm -hmm. you know, like physics, pop culture, all of that stuff still applies. But also, supernatural things exist, but most people are incapable of it. You know, they're compelled, most people who lack the sight are compelled to either ignore, rationalize, or forget the supernatural when they Enter it. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, when you do setting creation with your party, the first thing you have to do is sort of agree, okay, what's this campaign going to be? So, you know, are you like a close-knit group of friends who've known each other from high school? Are you like mages for hire, doing mercenary for people who can afford you? Are you, you know, a traveling circus who does real magic but tries to pass it all off as stage tricks? Once you've done that, the next step is every player proposes two factions that they would like to be an important part of the setting. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the idea can be serious or silly, detailed or vague, but, you know, just gives everyone something to work with. Mm -hmm. Then the next step is everyone picks two factions they want their PC to have a tie with. One of these ties has to lean positive, one of these ties has to lean negative. Mm -hmm. In my experience, what this ends up doing is, as soon as you're playing, everyone in the party has a whole bunch of plot hooks that the GM can then work with. They've given the, the GM a whole bunch of ideas they can incorporate with their world building. The, and also, everyone in the group has a sense of the world that they're about to enter because they all sat down and discussed it and built it together as a group. Because, okay, this is going to sound mean. In my experience, when you give a group homework, a lot of them just aren't going to do it. That's not being mean, that's being honest. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like, if you do a thing where, you know, the GM drafts up what their setting is going to be like and writes pages about the lore and the world and the backstory, maybe some of them will read it. <laughs> maybe, if you're lucky. Oh. I'll usually give I'll usually give a primer, but that primer is only one page long and is just... This is the, this is the cliff notes of the setting, and the cliffest of the cliff notes, and th this is... This is the tone for the game for the game that we're playing, and the these kind of character archetypes would probably be best avoided. Exactly. Something a, that uh, sorry, which is a fancy way of saying, if I'm if I say that we're running a investigative leaning campaign, don't come in trying to play a murder hobo. I'm not going to stop you, but you're not going to have a good time. Exactly. Like you know the tropes we're going to be leaning on don't really accommodate that. Like, I know when I'm kind of writing something I got into the habit of doing was basically bolding the text that I think is, like, most important so that if people are just skim reading it, they'll pick up on the part I really don't want to miss. Mm -hmm. Then people go, oh, that's really good for accessibility purposes. And I'm like, yes, that too. <laughs> Chalk that up to <laughs> accidental genius moment. <laughs> that's why I did it, sure. Mm-hmm. And I will admit that when you were when you were going over the collaborative setting steps, um, 
Some of it is, some of it I will admit is definitely reminiscent of the kind of things that people talk about when they discuss Session Zero. But mm. I was conjuring, ha, in the back of my mind, that. a um, a group, a group of a group of wizards who's basically the, um, the wizard, the wizarding version of the Men in Black. <laughs> the hell yeah. Oh. You know, de you know, dealing with dealing with um, dealing with dealing with um, ma dealing with um, magical items and the and the like, and trying to maintain a degree of neutrality in a in a given area. I.e., you have a you have a metropolis where you have thousands of ma of magical beings that are that exist in plain sight. Most of them are just tr are just trying to get are just trying to get by day to day like anybody else, but it, but there's always that one percent of them that are th that are keen to cause trouble. So that's a lot of fun because for me as a GM, if you gave me, I'm thinking like, okay, one, this is a treasure trove of story possibilities, mm -hmm. but also if I was a player. I can imagine playing a character who either had a positive or a negative relationship with that and what that would say about them. Oh, yeah. For example, what if I pissed that group off in the past? What did I do to piss them off in the past? How does that influence what kind of person I'm playing? Oh. Uh, I, I, I did something like this before, but I, t I took the, and I took the um, loss of identity th thing with that was within... Um, Within the Men in Black movie, and went to and went a further step. The idea is, there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of freedom that you ha that you have with within the boundaries. But the catch is, whoever you were, whoever you were, stop, stops exist, stops existing to the point that you don't even look the same as you were as you were. Exactly, like. Okay, so one of the things that originally inspired was actually Bioware's RPGs, stuff like Dragon Age and Mass Effect. Because mm -hmm. something that kind of hit me is, let's say there's the conflict between the Geth and the Quarians. Mm -hmm. On paper, that's like a very abstract political thing. But the game really makes you care about it because it gives you party members who like are attached to those factions, who have strong opinions about it. Who will sometimes butt heads about it. Mm. Like, you know, you always have that connection to the Quarians because of Tally. You always have the connection to the Geth Legion. So I kind of wanted to capture that sense that, okay, these setting elements are relevant to the party and basically bake that into Session Zero. Yeah. And Truth be truth be told, you look at any um any game during the during the golden run with White Wolf. They all they loved putting factions in their games. <laughs> oh like a, and it can work so so well. Like you know, people still to this day remember like the vampire. Yeah, and for the re for the record, I usually played Clan Ventru. Nice. Owning the world so you don't have to. <laughs> well, they did like a really smart thing when they were designing those factions where they basically said, okay, pop culture has like tons and tons of different types of vampires. Let's just make them a clan. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if you want to play the Anne Rice vampires, you go with Chador. If you want to play like Nosferatu, well, <laughs> does what it says on the tin. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want, and if you want. If you wanted to be, if you wanted to be the the um, vampiric equivalent to a shit post, Malkavian. Yep. Uh, but the th and if and if you wanted if you wanted to be a hipster vampire, well, that's what Bruja is for. Hipsters, or oh, you just want to beat the shit out of everything. Ah. <laughs> uh. But, and hell, hell, um, when it comes to that whole faction thing, one of my favorite RPGs of all time is Legend of the Five Rings, which nice. is all about that with the clans. Yeah, like in the 
when the game was just getting started, when wasn't the meta plot like influenced by how well people? To an to an extent, the Kotai tournaments definitely def, definitely definitely um had that relationship, but there weren't a there weren't a whole lot of supplements that went into that when it came to the RPG. Mm. There were there were a few things here and there, but not but it's not like every time a new edition of the um of the card game came out there was there was a supp there was a splat book that reflected it that that only happened a handful of times uh, but there were but um but they would they would in the in the Alderac days they there some of the editions would reflect certain events that were happening um for example second edition the edition we don't talk about um a lot of that was reflective of the clan war that was going on at the time. Whereas third edition was more reflective of to of the Totori dynasty and fourth edition the Iweko dynasty. Uh, that, that and with with fourth edition L five R they were trying to div they actually wanted to divorce themselves from the meta plot because an issue that an issue that could crop up is if you were if you were playing in the four winds era and somebody wanted to be a um da, a daidoji harrier but because but because of the because of the fa of the rule set that was used well at one po at one point in the story the daidoji family was wiped out and they weren't in, and they weren't in that and they weren't in a book so what are you going to do ah oh, god i i'll be honest i've i've never been too keen on meta plot in that sense because like as a gm i have a hard enough time predicting what my players are going to do like free sessions now <laughs> You know, never mind writing a plot that's meant to encompass any party that could hypothetically be playing this game. And often, I think some older editions of World of Darkness fell into this problem, where in order to basically enforce the meta plot, they had to fill the OP NPCs that could just railroad the party into going along with it. Yeah, I, I just... wasn't a f I wasn't a huge. F I understood why it was done, but I wasn't a huge fan of it. it Again, my philosophy has always been the creation of a sandbox. Exactly, exactly. Like, I... Okay, so this goes into... When I GM a campaign, mm -hmm. the stuff that I find most satisfying is I try to make about the PCs. Like, this is their narrative, ultimately. If the campaign goes in a direction that, you know, could only have happened because this particular group of PCs were involved in it, I consider that a success. Mm -hmm. That's just, you know, not saying that's the best way to run a campaign, it's what I find most personally. I find that meta plots often really, really butt up against that because, you know, the writers can't possibly account for who the people And, you know, that means that the plot is ultimately driven by these NPCs. Which like, makes sense. By necessity. <laughs> Not like it makes sense, it's by necessity. Mm -hmm. But... I don't think people play RPGs so they can jump for a series of predetermined groups. I wish someone would have to wished some... You um you kind of you kind of dipped into why I did why I didn't jump on the Avatar Legends bandwagon even though I'm a fan of it even though I'm a fan of the idea of role playing within the world of Avatar. It's a really cool setting. <laughs> yeah, uh, two really cool settings technically. <laughs> yeah, I just did, I um I was very I was very critical of some of the decisions that they had made. Up to and including the fact that the reasons that they gave for 
not making the not making an not making playable avatars a thing being kind of weak. Their reasoning was some things should remain mysterious. Yeah, I mm, I get what you mean. You know, it's a bit disappointing to play an avatar game and not play the avatar. For me, it's for me, it's an issue of. I feel like a I feel like a sandbox should ha should give the widest amount of storytelling possibilities as it can. Plus, okay, like on the one hand, I'm thinking, well, okay, part of the point of the avatar is that they're slightly more OP than everyone else in the party. But at the same time, I'm also thinking, yeah, but like Sokka wasn't a bender and he was a super bad party. And the other thing is Tosca how, probably kick ass. Yeah. How many um how many storytelling opportunities are you taking off the table because of that? Exactly. And you know, devil's advocate here. I could appreciate the argument that, you know, if you include the avatar in the party, in a sense that also limits the stories you could tell. Yeah. Because, you know, you have to tell stories that concern the avatar, but even then, yeah, it would be nice to have that option. Mm -hmm. Now, getting back on the rails, um, what are you shooting yes. for as far as a total page count? Okay, so at time of writing, the book is over 50,000 words. Mm -hmm. So what that amounts to is about 158 pages, give or take. All right, and I know I know there's only se there's only seven days left, and and I do want to give my congrats for how well the kicks how well the um Kickstarter is gone. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, lot better than expected. Not gonna lie, pretty overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, to the point where it's almost four times over its go its initial goal. <laughs> but. What are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a but just a general ballpark. Well, at this point, it's kind of in the hands of my artists. Mm -hmm. You know, ultimately, I don't necessarily want to rush anyone too much because, you know, let's say worst case scenario, the book is delayed by a few. If you have a lousy picture, that picture's going to be lousy for it. Ultimately, though, the date I set, and bear in mind, I expect this to be the absolute latest. I'm hoping to get this done way, way sooner than that. Mm -hmm. Hoping to have the book done by about September-ish. But that's just, you know, the book being fully laid out and illustrated. All the game's mechanics, um, all the writing in it, all that stuff is already done. And in fact, anyone who backs the book at the £6 tier above hmm. will basically get all of the book's mechanics pretty much as soon as the campaign. All right. And I'll, I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But... With that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. And also, thank you for indulging me in all the sidetracking we've done. <laughs> oh, it's par for the course around here. <laughs> I did. I did say. I did say that I do, that I tend to go a bit freeform with these kind of things. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come visit the temple and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>